answer a, a very straightforward question. How can we uh, imagine a future uh, for Gaza as part of the broader struggle for Palestinian liberation? The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. This is the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman. And I'm Asa Win Stanley. Welcome back to the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman. A new literary anthology, Light in Gaza, Writings Born of Fire, has just been published from Haymarket Books, a book that imagines what a future in Gaza could be in an attempt, as one of our guests and the co-editor of the book, Jihad Abu Salem, says, to break the intellectual blockade on Gaza. Jean-Pierre Filiou, author of Gaza, A History, says about the book, quote, as Mahmoud Darwish wrote as early as 1973, we do injustice to Gaza when we turn it into a myth. This is why Light in Gaza, through its insightful collection of essays and poems, offers such a unique picture of the Palestinian experience in a territory cut off from the world for a decade and a half. We're delighted to have Jihad, as well as two of the contributors to Light in Gaza, Writings Born of Fire, on with us today, Asma Abu Muzaid and Yusuf Al-Jamal. Jihad, Asma, and Yusuf, thank you so much for being with us, and congratulations on the publication of this anthology. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, Jihad, let's start with you as you're one of the co-editors, and um, this is a project of the American Friends Service Committee, where you are the education and policy associate at the Palestine Activism Program. Give us a sense of the scope of this book. Um, this, book's, this book seeks to answer a, a very straightforward question. Um, how can we uh, imagine a future uh, for Gaza as part of the broader struggle for Palestinian liberation. Um, and I think the, uh, the answer lies in the common thread that brings together, combines all the pieces and chapters and poems um, and even wonderful photos that uh, people will see in the book. Uh, the answer is simple. Uh, the Nakba has got to end. Um, the Nakba, the catastrophe that befell Palestinians in 1948, was not just uh, an event relegated to a specific point in time. Uh, the expulsion of Palestinians, the Israel's, uh, uh, you know, uh, efforts to remove Palestinians from their lands, to re to render them as refugees uh, behind fences, so that. It can maintain its uh, Jewish majority formula. Uh, all these uh, are processes that started before and during 1948, during the Nakba and still continue until today. And we, in the book, we look at Gaza as one of, as an example of how the Nakba continues today. Um, and we try to think about the several aspects of Gaza's experience and within uh, this framework. Um, so it, the, the, the book is about is about framing, it's about analysis, and it's about the, the richness and the diversity of the Palestinian experience of Gaza. And most importantly, it's about uh, it's about conveying the uh, the voice of Palestinians in Gaza to the outside world and, and making their voices heard. Asma, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work as a writer and uh, as one of the contributors to this anthology. Yeah, thank you, Nora. Um, so I consider myself a beginner gardener. And it's, it's ironic because I started my gardening journey um, uh, because, I, because it's related to my work. So I wanted to connect with nature, but also to understand the experiences of the women that I work with. Um, and one fact that it was interesting to, for me to see is that I had a, a one type of flower um, that uh, I was trying to grow and it lasted a year without blooming. Um, so I was like almost ready to give up. And it, for me, it was interesting that only during the aggression of 2021, when like things were about like just 
give up, um, it bloomed. Um, and I felt like it's a message for me um, to continue. Um, and that was also through the process of writing the chapter. Um, my work in the, in the book is looking at um, the lost identity, um, the, pa the lost Palestinian identity between agriculture and environment. Um, and I'm tra trying to look at our grandparents' relationship to the land, uh, to the agriculture as a profession, but also as a part of a movement of resistance that Palestinian farmers has been leading. Uh, and Gaza in particular, what does it mean for it? So it's a lot inspired from my own grandparents who are farmers uh, by heart and by profession, but it's also um, a reflection on what does farming mean to us now uh, in Gaza with all the restriction that we are seeing, with all the very systematic attack on agriculture as a profession, but in its essence as an attack uh, on agriculture as an identity as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, the, the essay that um, is in the book is called On Why We Still Hold Onto Our Phones and Keep Recording. Um, and, you know, just the title of that kind of struck me um, because, you know, we're coming off of the heels of yet another um, brutal Israeli assault on Gaza just last month. Um, can you talk about, um, about why, you know, what that title means and, and, and kind of the, you know, how, how it relates to not just, um, you know, something that, that you witnessed last year, but, but something that keeps happening again and again. Yeah. Um, so, during the aggression last year, um, like the amount of trip, like guilt that we felt because we are every single day we woke up and we are the lucky ones uh, who survived, uh, but also the fact that we have to sit um, on screen uh, to monitor everything is happening, but also get exposed to the discussion that dehumanize you, that put you in a space that you have to prove that you are worthy of even breathing or even taking a space to speak uh, was something really um, suffocating. But what I felt most uh, important is not that we should write to them. Um, actually, we should write to ourselves. Um, and I think this is something we tend to forget. But with generations after generation, um, that kind of collective memory is not something that is preserved. And I've seen it with my work in, uh, in, uh, on the chapter on agriculture. And I felt it's important for us to document and, and write and record because later on in 20 years time, there will be people who will tell us and make us feel that we have not done enough, that we have run away, we were covered. So it was not really for them. It was only for our future generation that, you know, you need to understand what we went through and you need to understand like how we continue to um, do our work to survive um, and to take that knowledge as a, as a way of strength to also continue. Thanks, Asma. Um, Yusuf, you're a longtime writer and journalist. Uh, you've contributed to the Electronic Intifada many times. Tell us about your essay, which is called Travel Restrictions as a Manifestation of Nakba, Gaza, the Path Backwards is the Path Forward. Um, tell us about, about your essay and, um, and what it entails. Thank you for having us uh, today. Uh, as you know, some of the writings that I have published with the Electronic Intifada address the issue of travel restrictions from a personal perspective. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, the situation or the experience of my family in Gaza vis-a-vis -vis travel restrictions uh, is unique. It's not, but it's a, a personal representation of this collective experience travel restrictions and how they affect, you know, our lives, how they affect patients. Uh, I have written about, uh, you know, my sister, for example, being denied a permit to have a surgery, a minor surgery in Jerusalem and losing her life. About my mother trying to get a permit for 12 years to visit her own family in the West Bank. Uh, 
And I thought that this is um, the best way to tell the story, to connect it with the personal, because people do relate to personal stories. So my chapter in the book uh, argues that for Gaza to live a better future, travel restrictions have to be uh, lifted and removed altogether so that Gaza could connect with the outside world on one hand and could, could also connect with the uh, rest of Palestine, with the West Bank and uh, what is today Israel, uh, for Palestinians to be able to travel freely so that um, no Palestinian would have to wait, you know, for the borders to open or, uh, you know, cancer patients wouldn't have to wait for Israeli permits to get their um, uh, medication. And uh, many of them actually have lost their, their lives. So my chapter asks uh, for, you know, leaving these restrictions and showing how, if the, how when these uh, restrictions are lift, that Palestinian lives could uh, improve, that we could go back to the original settings when Gaza was connected with the rest of Palestine and the rest of the world. Um, the same as the situation uh, or the case uh, was before 1948, where we could, as a family, be united. You know, I haven't seen my, my family in a single uh, place since I was born because we are divided by restrictions, by checkpoints, by borders, by permits. I have family everywhere, in, in, almost in, in the region, in, in Jordan, in, um, in, in, in the Gulf, in Europe, in the US, uh, but we cannot meet in, in a single place. Uh, so for Gaza to move forward, we have to go back to the original settings. That is when Gaza was connected with the rest of Palestine. And in, uh, under these circumstances, people could travel freely. Students wouldn't have to lose their scholarships because the border is, is uh, shut down or because a checkpoint is, 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 uh, uh, is not allowing them to uh, leave. Uh, and in, in this case, as I said, patients wouldn't have to die. Um, we as a, a family could be in one place. And you know, one of the um, main targets of Israel's occupation has been the, the fabric of Palestinian families uh, and the Palestinian society as a whole. So breaking down families is part of this uh, ongoing Nakba that Jihad uh, addressed at the beginning of, of uh, his intervention, that you know what is happening today in Gaza, this siege and these travel restrictions are continuing uh, since 1948. They are a continuation of the ongoing Nakba that we have relived many times and we are still living every day. Absolutely. Um, part of this book uh, is, is not just talking about what has happened and what keeps happening to Gaza, but also uh, what could be Gaza's future. What does it mean for both of you, Asma, maybe you can start um, to reimagine Gaza apart from its designation as, you know, an open air prison or a massive research and development factory for Israeli weapons, or, you know, the home to 2 million people, 80% of whom are refugees. How do we talk about Gaza in terms of the future and in terms of um, preserving identity, culture, and liberation struggle? Um, I think one of the one of the things uh, that we've done in, in in the book and also in the chapter is tracking that history. And I think in tracking the history um, and having that macro lens on how identity evolved in terms of agriculture and environment, for example, um, it really show you the magnitude of. Uh, a systematic attack on, on, uh, on this identity and how even the basics that would preserve a future that could support a different future is, is undermined in every way, um, but also that there are attempts, always there is attempts of reclaiming who we are and reclaiming what we want to do. But I also... Um, I also warn against the romanticization of these attempts because it has a reserve that is not endless. Um, and that there is so many things that, that needs to be done. To be honest, 
uh, I ended the chapter while writing it with uh, a message of hope and a reimagining. And then the May aggression happened. Um, and I and I uh, and I talked to my editor and I told uh, her I want to take back um, and I want to change the ending uh, because honestly, without stopping um, what's happening in Gaza, without the end of the blockade and the occupation, any future will only put the burden on Palestinians in Gaza to imagine a future uh, that is, you know, bright future. And that's in itself a narrative that we should call it out and we should fight it. There are so many attempts. I can't tell you about the attempts of people like gathering, you know, local seeds and, uh, and trying to preserve the little that exists. But then we cannot ignore how economic and social deterioration is affecting and suffocating even these spaces. Um, and the need for even Palestinian in the diaspora and, and everywhere to be aware of that, um, to know that there is a, a relentless effort that needs to be taken in place, uh, not only during aggression, uh, but during all year long. Yusuf or Jihad, did you want to add to that? Uh, I think uh, I agree with Asma. Uh, so the situation is catastrophic in many different ways. Uh, there is an ongoing tragedy that also cannot be separated from the whole, you know, Nakba, the whole tragedy that is taking place in Palestine every day. Uh, and people need to be aware of that. Um, people should know that, you know, the impact of um, the 15-year-old uh, siege on, on Gaza, on people losing their lives, but most importantly, um, losing, um, you know, the belief that a solution could be uh, reached. We have people who, who, love, who have lost uh, hope, but at the same time, there are some people who are trying to struggle and survive, and despite the, uh, you know, the struggles and difficulties, they're trying to somehow get it through and um, build their own future. We have uh, a very good IT uh, community in, in, in Gaza. People are trying to build their own startups, for example, or small projects. But again, the whole picture, we cannot separate this from the challenges people uh, face. We have people working on, for example, solution uh, for uh, contemplated, you know, uh, water or, uh, uh, you know, 97% of Gaza's water is unfit for human consumption. We have people working um, to, to solve this problem. But again, we, we, we have a long way to go on many different uh, levels. Remonetizing life in Gaza, I think, uh, is more harmful than beneficial to, to the people of Gaza. And that's why when many delegations used to uh, come to Gaza when I was there, I would take them to the most impoverished you know, areas in Gaza so that they could see uh, the, the impact the siege had on, on people because this is real life. The majority of people live this life in Gaza today. Unfortunately, 15 years on, the siege has not ended. It's getting worse every day. But at the same time, we want to highlight that the people who are resisting, uh, the people who did not lose hope, they're doing their best to survive and you know continue their lives under these uh, circumstances, that they are also thinking of the future and solutions, and not just for Gaza, but the whole you know situation, the occupation, settler colonialism in Palestine, that they see themselves as part of this liberation project. And that's why, for example, we have the Great March of Return. We had the Great March of Return. It's not only about Gaza. It's also about the rest of Palestine. And that's why also you see people from Gaza following the news of Palestinians in the West Bank and, and today's Israel, because we cannot separate you know, um, these communities. And uh, the people in Gaza to think of, the, you know, of Palestinians in the diaspora and elsewhere, they see themselves as part of one project. Uh, but at the same time, they want to tell the world that the impact of siege on them had been very catastrophic and uh, the image is not very bright, unfortunately.
Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of, you know, all of the, 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 the very small uh, NGO projects that, you know, these uh, they, like the US and the EU and Canada like to tout as, you know, we are, we are doing something for the Palestinian people while still sending, you know, billions and billions of dollars to support Israel at every turn and, and resupply Israel with weapons when it wants to bomb Gaza or, um, you know, so it's like these very piecemeal sort of um, tokenization and 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 uh, really like a, a dehumanization project of Palestinians. Like like they don't know how to support themselves, so the EU is going to do something, um, you know, to to help. You know, where whereas the this is not <laughs> what Palestinians need in terms of a liberation struggle and support for that. Um, Jihad, did you want to talk a little bit about about imagining this future in that context? Sure. Uh, the book does not provide uh, clear cut recipes for what what the future should look like, uh, and this is important to say here because you know the the contributors uh, to the book uh, do not necessarily represent. Uh, the multiplicity of opinion in, in, in Palestine. We tried to capture uh, as many perspectives as, uh, as we can. Um, and we tried to portray a complex picture about how Palestinians in Gaza, from Gaza, in Gaza, and outside Gaza, and, and one of the authors is actually from the West Bank who has never stepped foot in Gaza, but you know, Sohail Taha. You will read his chapter on electricity and and what and and what the power crisis uh, does to people there. It's a pretty fascinating piece. Uh, so we we try to bring together all these perspectives uh, in the book to uh, to portray this picture to show that you know here here are some of the conversations uh, that uh, these authors. Uh, uh, are having uh, and and they are representative of some of the discussions that are ongoing uh, in the Palestinian street on social media in in, in the civil society academic and scholarly uh, circles and so on and so forth. Um, but I think what's more important about the book is its politics. Um, and the kind of analysis it uh, encourages people to embrace when thinking about Gaza. And, and again, I would like to reiterate my initial point about the, the, his, the historical context that surrounds Gaza. We, uh, and speaking of all the, you know, the, the band-aids, right, that the international community has been, uh, uh, you know, has tried for decades to use, um, to manage the situation, to control Gaza, to tame Gaza, without you know, without without any of these solutions actually working out. Uh, so, so it's a it's 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 a matter of politics, and it's a matter of analysis, and it's a matter of how do we understand Gaza. And to understand Gaza, we need to go back to 1948. We need to go back to that moment when uh, a part of Palestine, the Gaza district. Uh, which was uh, one of uh, the historic Palestine's largest administrative districts, was reduced in size and cut from the rest of historic Palestine, uh, was, was turned into the, the Gaza Strip that we, we know today, uh, and uh, where hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were pushed towards the, uh, the, the southwest and towards the, the west, um, and to be made refugees. People, when Palestinians ended up in Gaza in 1948, uh, they weren't planning on staying there uh, for decades. They weren't planning on staying in the Gaza Strip as refugees, living in eight refugee camps. These people had land, had property. They lived in cities and towns with dignity and honor. And uh, and but here we are. It's 2022, and you know the Gaza Strip is this small geographic area that is confined and fenced off from the rest of the world, just so that Israel can maintain its Jewish majority. I mean, if we look at the numbers, uh, the 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 rate of uh, of population density in Gaza today 
uh, revolves around 6,000 to 7,000 human beings in a square kilometer. Uh, in in, uh, in American uh, terms, that's 13,000 persons per a square mile. And by 2050, uh, this, this will double. So we're talking about a Gaza Strip with 4 million and a half people. Uh, where the population density will reach 35,000 human beings per a square mile. We're talking about an impoverished, small strip of land that lacks resources, that lacks the ability to support the people who live in it to, to maintain their physical well-being. And, and yes, people in Gaza are fighters. They have been resisting. They will continue to resist. Um, and they're, they're willing to put up a fight, you know, and... And Gaza is an example of how a group of people will refuse to be, uh, you know, f- to, f- to see their rights reduced from political ones about the liberation, self-determination into, you know, just a humanitarian case of begging for bones. No, it's th- that's not what Gaza is about. Um, and, and that's why we wanted to push for a fresh and, and, and brave political understanding of what is wrong uh, with our with current our current understanding and approach, especially in, in the context of the international community when it comes to Gaza. Uh, and, and I talk about this in the introduction uh, for, to the book. And I talk about how, for example, the so-called two-state solution, uh, which is internationally accepted and promoted as the solution uh, for, the, for the Palestine question, um, it, it does not and will not help Gaza because there is there are no practical solutions even for you know the, the questions such as demographic expansion and growth right like Israel today justifies its settlement expansion in the West Bank on the basis of natural population growth but nobody is talking about natural population growth in Gaza where are these people going to go if Israel continues to colonize the West Bank then are these Palestinians in Gaza, this population that has been growing, supposed to move into parts of the West Bank when they are part of a Palestinian state, according to the two-state solution? There are no answers. Nobody is willing to answer these existential questions. So, And that shows that we need to go back to 1948. We need to address the, the processes that have that have been set in motion since 1948. Uh, the, these are structural uh, processes and issues that uh, that are about maintaining the privile- privileges and superiority and power of a certain group at the expense of another. It's as simple as that, and that's the message of the book. Thank you, Jihad. Um, Asma, what do you hope readers take away from this collection? Mm. The, the journey of writing the book was very enlightening for me um, because, um, interestingly enough, there isn't spaces to talk about uh, our identity from an agricultural and environmental lens. Um, and in my journey of writing this chapter, I started appreciating or actually like just walking by a tree and like trying to guess how old is this tree because like, one tree that was near my grandparents' house was uh, planted in 1956. Uh, uh, um, and it's still there. It's, it has a social significance. Um, but then we, we no longer um, linger on, on this uh, res- resemblance of identity and significance of identity. And, and I think it's something very important for us us as Palestinian to to reconnect um, to what uh, land is. Um, land and agriculture is beyond livelihood. Livelihood and having, you know, food on your table is one aspect. But historically, as you had mentioned, and we need to look at that historically, agriculture was a collective action. It was an action where people can collectively organize and work together. To, to have the harvest. And that collective spirit was also very beneficial in terms of like resistance, in terms of even, you know, social change as well. Um, 
Unfortunately, the more we have diminishing agricultural spaces, the spaces with the demographic expansion, the more we are seeing a shift in that uh, and a loss of that collective organizing, that collective spirit um, that we use, it, it used to be part of our identity. What I really want uh, readers to take um, for Palestinian, I wish that this is a space for them to reflect a lot. Um, and I explain in, in some part, we like to wear necklaces of, you know, olive trees, but we don't think about the experience of the farmer on a daily basis of how he maintains that olive uh, tree, despite all the attack on that olive tree. So uh, to buy a necklace is something good, but to support Palestinian product and to support the local Palestinian product and, and Creating a demand for these Palestinian products is something that will help these farmers to continue, you know, being a resistance and to continue their work on that angle. For other like readers, um, I think and I hope that uh, reading the book in general would give uh, people an insight on how we think as Palestinian in Gaza and also what what does Gaza mean. Uh, I always when people come to Gaza. Uh, in a very few days, and suddenly they realize that they know Gaza more than us. Um, uh, and they stay in the fanciest places and and judge how Gaza is no need of like, you know, support and so on. I, I really um, tell them that, in my opinion, Gaza is like a, a very old lady. If you look at her face, um, you have so much wrinkles um, that should tell a story of what it has uh, gone through. Uh, what does that lady is telling you to listen to and where she has reached that old age and what was the cost on her health, on her body, and even on her spirit to reach that age. And I hope that the book is an attempt for people to listen to that lady um, telling them her story um, with her voices, with her experiences, um, and to to listen um, and to give that spaces uh, for Palestinians from Gaza to speak and tell their story. Yusuf, did you want to add to that? What do you hope readers take away from uh, your essay and the essays of, of your colleagues in this anthology? I think uh, one important thing that uh, if this book achieves uh, would be a great success uh, uh, is that, uh, as you know, Palestinians have always been dehumanized and reduced into statistics and numbers. Uh, so I hope that uh, these stories and chapters and personal experiences will push people to think and connect with the Palestinian people. Uh, for example, when we talk about travel restrictions and say 10,000 people were denied permits, for example, to travel to the West Bank, or were not able, you know, the 100 students were not able to travel through the Rafah crossing and lost their scholarships, um, let's say this year, that they connect with these people because uh, these people have, you know, personal stories, they have families, they have history, they have they have hopes and aspirations they want to achieve. And by reading, you know, these stories that people will be able to connect uh, with the normal Palestinian on the ground in Gaza and elsewhere in, in Palestine. Like when they travel, for example, when they cross a border, when they get to an airport or when they get on a flight, they will remember Palestinians who cannot. Uh, and they work to end this uh, injustice, especially that uh, in some cases, like the case of the US, for example, this is happening because, uh, because of the US tax money given to Israel every year to maintain this system of, of apartheid and military occupation. Um, so people would take action so that when they feel that the story of Palestinians in Gaza matters to them, and means something to them that they will take political action on a grassroots level, on an institutional level, on a political level to bring about change. And we've seen some of these initiatives recently, uh, for example, taking place at the US Congress, 
some resolutions to uh, link U.S. aid to Israel to the treatment of Palestinians and uh, respecting the human rights of the Palestinians, including Palestinian children. So hopefully this will also bring about change. We wrote these stories not because we enjoy writing about our tragedies. Retelling these stories is very painful to us every time, especially when we talk about personal tragedies. But we write about these personal tragedies and destruction and death because we hope that our future will be better than uh, our past or our tomorrow is better than uh, our yesterday. And uh, which means that a political change will happen. So people will, who will read the book and the chapters will try to bring about political change to end the siege and the occupation uh, of Gaza and the rest of Palestine. Yusuf Ajamal, Asma Abu Muzaid, and Jihad Abu Salem, um, thank you so much for being with us today on the Electronic Intifada podcast. The book, again, is called Light in Gaza, Writings Born of Fire, published by Haymarket Books. Jihad is one of the editors, along with Jennifer Bing and Michael Merriman Lotz. Uh, we'll have links to... Um, uh, the book itself and more about um, some of its authors uh, on the Electronic Intifada blog, uh, podcast blog post that accompanies this episode. Thank you all so much and congratulations again on the book. Thank you, Nora. Thank you. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.